Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your Senior Enlisted Advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we, go, before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-hosts, Kiana Holloman and Emily Zars. How y'all doing, ladies? Good. How are you? I'm doing good, and, and happy Fat Tuesday. Yes, yes. it's Mardi Gras. <laughs> Today's the day. So, today is the day to get it in, so you can you can not do anything for the rest for the next uh, however how long. Let's. This is our New Year's <laughs> resolution all over again. Right. Awesome. Exactly. Awesome. But well, we got a great show today. Uh, and without further ado, uh, Emily, please introduce today's guest. So today's guest is an author whose writing has appeared in popular publications worldwide. He joins us today to give a military exclusive look at his new book that has come out today, which is super exciting, Wonderless. Please give a warm Chief Chat welcome to Reed Mittenbuehler. Hey. Thank you. Thank you for having me. There we go. <laughs> So, Reed, man, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on. Awesome, awesome. Can you let our viewers know kind of where you're joining us from? I am joining from Los Angeles, California. So I got a chance to go to L.A. Um, what was that the weekend of the Super Bowl? Uh, and uh, that Saturday, it was like, because, you know, you go to L.A. for the weather or whatever. It was freezing that day i was like what <laughs> what is going on like I, I i i was dressed for um hawaii or la during the summertime but yeah i had to find a coat real fast i actually <laughs> love it when it's relatively cold here i grew up in the cold and in, in michigan and indiana so i kind of welcome the a little bit cooler weather <laughs> gotcha Every now and then it trickles down to Texas and we just don't know what to do when things other than rain start falling from the sky. We're just like, <laughs> what is this? What do we do? How do we drive in this? <laughs> Run for cover. <laughs> exactly. And so Reed, we are so excited to discuss your latest book, Wonderless. I have my copy, came out today. Um, so this is your third published book. Having previously written Bourbon Empire and Wild Minds, so what piqued your interest in history book writing to begin with? Well, I've always been a big reader, you know, since I was a little kid. And at one point, I started to wonder about the people who are putting these stories together. I thought, you know, I want to do that. And that, that relates to my own time in the Air Force, actually. I was in the Air Force for a little while. I joined because I was in college at the time. I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do when I got out. But I knew I wanted some sort of adventure. I valued service. I wanted life experience. I ultimately wanted to be a writer. I think that life experience is important for writers. So the military helped me helped me that way. Now, so your latest release finds readers unpacking the story of Danish explorer Peter Forkin. For those who don't know, who is Peter Forkin and what inspired you to tell his story? So. I think Peter Freakin is one of the most interesting people from the 20th century. If you remember the Dos Equis uh, beer commercial ads, the most interesting man in the world, he's almost like a real life version of that. Uh, and I stumbled on his story in a very interesting way. It's a, several years ago, about seven years ago, I was living in New York and a friend invited me to a place called the Explorers Club. It's this old mansion on the Upper East Side. And if you go there, it looks like the set of a Wes Anderson movie you've got. Persian rugs, like leather club chairs, these old maps on the wall. There's artifacts all over the place from all these long ago expeditions. Teddy Roosevelt, Thor Heyerdahl, people like that have been members. So it's kind of got this throwback feel. And we go to the top floor to a place called the Trophy Room. And this is full of, you know, it's got, it's got a pelt from a Siberian tiger that was rumored to have eaten 48 people. Um, it's got a stuffed yeah. cheetah, it's got all this stuff. And we have a bottle of whiskey with us. I also wrote a, a, a history of whiskey, American whiskey. And we're just going to catch up. 
and we pop down in a couple big chairs. It takes me a while to notice this painting over the fireplace. It's of this guy, guy on the cover, Peter Frey. He's got this burly beard. He's wearing a suit. He's six and a half feet tall. He's got a, a peg leg, kind of like a pirate. And I think if you have your portrait over the fireplace in a place like the Explorers Club, you, you have to have done something pretty interesting. Walk up to the painting, <laughs> I see his name on a brass black. And I read it's like, who is this guy? What did he do? So I look him up and this incredible story emerges. It's like Mark Twain or someone could have written this guy's life. It's He's got this Where's Waldo aspect to his mouth. He's like, he's all over the 20th century, popping up in history. It's like he's photobombing history. He's meeting all these famous people. Um, he starts his career as an Arctic explorer. He goes on all these expeditions where he keeps cheating death. He marries an Inuit woman, becomes part of her community. Then he ends up in Golden Age Hollywood, the 1930s, where he makes the most expensive movie ever made up to that point. He's in the White House meeting Herbert Hoover, who cleared his calendar for a little bit just so he could continue his conversation. Then he's in World War II. He's working with the Danish Resistance. He's on this game show, the $64,000 question. It's, it's the biggest thing on TV. It's like crime goes down in cities when it's on TV. He wins that. He's talking about climate change before anyone's talking about that. It's like every time you turn around, this guy's just doing something totally wild, but there's real depth to his story as well, a lot of lessons, and I just had to write the story. Man, he, he so I was looking at this fur coat that he has on the on the cover of the book, <laughs> and, and I'm thinking like, is is this like a cross between like a bison and a, and a grizzly bear, or man, it, it, it looks pretty snazzy though. I probably, you know what, I needed that. There. So I, I needed that during my LA trip uh, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> when, 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 <laughs> I probably could have got into some real fancy, fancy restaurants if I would have walked around with that th with that thing on. <laughs> that coat probably weighs a hundred pounds. <laughs> it did. Look at look at that. My, my goodness, that's a lot of eating right there. Cold, whatever, whatever was. So, yeah, you're not so getting as, cold as far as, so what's your research process whenever you kind of, because that's a, that's a cool story to just be like, you know what, hanging out with friends at this, this, this kind of nice bar with a lot of history and you just see a, a random photo and say, you know what, let me, let me check this guy out. So is it, is it, is it as simple as it sounds Google or is it, are you, are you kind of, you know, can you, can you take us through that guess? that process a little bit? Yeah, it's definitely not Google. If you Google Freiken, you'll see all of these really crazy stories, um, you know, that have become internet memes and, and everything. A lot of inaccuracies in those. And you can see how those start. You know, someone starts a story, they get a detail wrong, and then it gets, it gets amplified yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of in a telephone game kind of thing. Um, so my research for this book, every book that I've done has been different. It's a mix of, you know, archival and interviews and other people's books and that sort of thing. So Freakin himself is a very successful writer. He's a best-selling novelist and he wrote thousands of pages of memoirs, both published and unpublished. You know, I looked at all of them. He was a big letter writer. So I had his correspondence, which is always a treasure trove. I, I think people talk a little more openly sometimes in their correspondence because it's, it's private. Um, he and his crewmates during a lot of his expeditions, they kept journals and then they later wrote books and memoirs about their experiences. So I utilize those. I talked to historians who knew a lot about him. I talked to his family uh, to get a lot of facts. I had plenty of material. The challenge with a book like this isn't scraping together enough information. It's the opposite. It's having this huge pile of information and figuring out what to leave on the cutting room floor. Well, I mean, from the looks of, of your bookshelf, you got a whole library right behind you. It's like a whole Dewey Decimal System to find. I was like, how do you find what you're looking for uh, out of all the books that you got behind you, man? That's that's pretty impressive. That's very impressive. Those are alphabetical. Or right, oh, really? they're just for show. I haven't read any of them. <laughs> <laughs> I've got them fiction and nonfiction, and they're alphabetical. Oh, my gosh. That's serious. <laughs> That's awesome. And so the experiences of explorers were mostly chronicled in their journals, giving future generations a chance to live vicariously through them. So why do you feel it's important to continue to share their stories today? Several reasons. 
you know, a lot of times their times in the past were a lot tougher than ours with different kinds of hardships. So I think that remembering their stories and the times they lived in helps us appreciate our own time a little bit more and what we've achieved since then. And it also helps us appreciate what people from the past have helped us achieve. It's this building process over time. I think their perspective is valuable in that regard. And also because I think sometimes some things from the past, you know, were good that, and they've been lost and remembering those good things help us preserve them. And also there's the answer, you know, history is always repeating itself. It's always echoing. I think understanding the past helps us understand our present and helps us understand the future we're going into. You know, with Fraken, one of the biggest threats he faced in his time uh, was rising authoritarianism authoritarianism in Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, communist Russia. You know, we see a little bit, we see echoes of that today with rising authoritarian you know, Russia, China, Turkey, Brazil, here, unfortunately. So understanding the past helps us understand, I think a lot of times the time we're in now and where it's going, because history does cycle. No, that is so true. And we'll talk a little bit more about Freudian's views and some more eccentric things about him, but we actually have a trailer of the book now, so let's take a look. The true story of a forgotten legend. From the high Arctic, across the Amazon, through the golden age of Hollywood, to World War II. An imperfect idealist, an eccentric romantic, an environmentalist ahead of his time. He chased adventure to the ends of the earth. A man who embraced life's wonder and mystery, driven by that universal urge. Wow. So let's get into it. <laughs> that was a lot in, in one minute. But Freud definitely lived up to the most interesting man title that critics and history buffs of liked have given him. So from exploring the Arctic and fighting for Jewish refugees during World War II, his life was not devoid at all of any adventure. So while you were learning about him, what was like your favorite discovery and learning more about his life? There were so many. I mean, this story, it's one of the interesting things about Freiken is every time you take a turn, you're just in some totally different place. And you're in the Arctic, you're in Golden Age Hollywood. So there are a million stories, a million people he read. One of my favorite stories, and it's a through line of the book, actually has to do with the Air Force. Um, if you know Thule Air Base up in Northern Greenland, oh, Freiken yeah. actually helped name Thule. Yeah, he actually helped name it back in 1909. He lived there for over a decade around that time, around World War One and leading up to World War One. Except back then, it was one of the most remote places on Earth. It was about as far north as human beings on the planet lived. The people who lived there, Inuit people, indigenous peoples, um, they'd been there living the same kind of lifestyle culture for centuries. Uh, they were so far north that they were relatively uninfluenced by missionaries, explorers, by the outside world. So Freakin and his best friend, Nude Rasmussen, another famous explorer, they go up there to live among them. And Freiken falls in love with their lifestyle and our culture. He marries an Inuit woman named Navarana. Uh, he has children with her. He's adopted into their culture. And he records their way of life. He's an anthropologist. So he can share it with the rest of the world. He thinks they have a perspective about life that's worth sharing with people. So he and Rasmussen are telling the world about Thule. And one day in the 1920s, they tell their friend Bernd Balkan, who's one of the best aviators in the world. Uh, he was actually beat across the Atlantic by Charles Lindbergh by two days. So two days earlier, and we would all know Bert Balkan's name instead of Charles Lindbergh. <laughs> and, and during World War II, Balkan, he also, um, he was recruited into the Air Force by U.S. Air Force General Henry Hap Arnold, you know, an Air Force icon. Oh, yeah. Uh, he was this, yeah, he was this amazing bomber pilot in World War II. So after the war, World War II, the Cold War is gearing up. It's starting. And the U.S. wants to build a base in the Arctic to counter the Soviets up there. So they ask Balkan, you know, what he thinks, where should we put this base? And he remembers back to that conversation he had had with Rasmussen in the 20s, singing Thule's praises. You know, it's a deep water harbor. 
It has all these wide open spaces for lots of runways. And that's how Thule ended up there. And Freuken would continue visiting even after he stopped living up there and you know, meeting with his friends who were displaced when the base was built. Uh, but he used it as a barometer of all these changes that were happening in the wider world. This place that was once so isolated that, that it was almost impossible to reach. You could only reach there a couple times a year uh, when the ice was just sort of thawed enough to get through. Um, you know, now it has military flights there going on a daily basis. And I use that story in the book to map and explore this general idea of change and how it affects our lives, you know, how we're all interconnected in ways that we don't always see. It's a really special story and it runs through the book. No, that's an amazing story. And um, I was just on an interview earlier today uh, and uh, the person that was interviewing me asked me, uh, cause we were talking about uh, where AFES or the exchange is in different parts of the world in, in locations many people may not know. And uh, I mentioned Thule Greenland and he was asking me, you know, what, where, which, which one of the sites did I want to go to next? And I, I mentioned Thule Greenland. And so I didn't, I didn't know that, uh, if Freuchen was, you know, was tuned into that part of the world. Uh, but when you say Arctic Explorer, uh, it's definitely cold in Thule Greenland and I can only go during certain parts of the year or otherwise I get stuck there for a lot longer than, than, I, than I care to be, but, uh, definitely looking forward to going to Thule and checking that out uh, operation that we have out there as well. But man, that is awesome how uh, all this stuff is kind of connected. Absolutely. But it, it talk about connection we're, to, um, you know, he spent a lot of time alone in, in, in isolated places. And so uh, again, uh, kind of paralleling back to the, to the military or just Air Force or military as a whole, uh, we talk about mental health issues. And so um, in your research, he, he was in a lot of places alone and he dealt with uh, mental health issues. What what kind of coping mechanisms uh, helped him overcome those issues or maybe something that our viewers can use uh, as we're coping with mental health issues on a regular basis? Great question. Uh, two things. Uh, Freakin's mental health issues are often exacerbated by extreme loneliness. He's living in these extremely isolated places, sometimes by himself. There's one episode I talked about earlier in the book He's out next to Greenland's ice sheet in a little cabin throughout the winter, all by himself, monitoring weather equipment. Um, so he's got no human contact out there. So getting for him, getting back into the company of people, finding community, uh, nurturing his friendships, that always helped him with some of his mental health struggles. I also noticed while reading his correspondence that he wasn't afraid to show vulnerability. You know, he has this image of being the epitome of a tough guy, you know, especially if you, you Google and look up on the internet, but that didn't mean he wasn't sensitive. Uh, in his world, especially, I imagine it could be challenging to show vulnerability, but it's actually a courageous thing for him to do. I, I think that helped him. Another thing is after he lost his foot, it was in this accident in Northern Canada, frostbite, and it eventually had to be ap amputated. He fell into a deep depression you know, for, for obvious reasons, but his doctor, who he was old friends with, made him hang out with other amputees who all had very, very positive attitudes. And Freakin learned just how powerful positive thinking could be. And that actually helped him continue to have his wild adventures. Now, it's interesting, after the loss of his foot, um, the second half of his life is actually just as, if not more action packed than the first part of his life. Uh, and in many ways, it was a lot more interesting than it was before he lost his foot. And so his positive attitude and, you know, the relationships he kept, the, the community he always nurtured, looking out for people around him who in return helped look out for him was a really important way for him to stay mentally healthy. Yeah. And to me, that resonates with our kind of wounded warrior program. It's when you mentioned you know, getting around a support group or like-minded individuals that are going through kind of similar struggles uh, due to, um, you know, TBI or uh, missing missing limbs, and, and that that to bring the bring folks together to to support each other and to have someone you can call that you feel like you can relate to a lot more than other folks. I think that's uh, that's that's cool how they were doing that back then, and and how we've you know we've adopted that nowadays to help our, our, our service members and their families. Absolutely. And he had a great, he had a great support network that way. 
And it takes a certain amount of innate resiliency to live the life that Freudian lived. Um, and he survived the harsh conditions and challenges of exploring the Arctic, and he escaped from a Nazi prison camp during World War II. What message do you feel readers can take away from Freudian's heroism? First of all, I like that you use the word resiliency. I wish more people would talk about that word, use that and word. And I said it Our right, cultures. too. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, before this, we were practicing, and I could not I could not get that word out. So I'm actually glad you pointed that out. That means I said it right. <laughs> <laughs> well, our culture... <laughs> Our culture has been doing a good job of teaching people to be more sensitive to others, but I think we could also probably do a better job of teaching more resiliency alongside mm -hmm. that. Uh, I think it's a good operating principle, and I think something like it came into play for Freuken when we discuss his heroism and how he addressed the many challenges you know, that he faced during these adventures in his life. As I was saying before, yeah, he was a tough guy, but he was also a sensitive guy. Um, he opened himself to other people. He needed to be both things to get through it all. And I think that defines his heroism. Um, you know, he wasn't locked into this one column and he was inspiring that way. He could be vulnerable. No, I love it. I definitely agree. You need to have that balance. And because he had balance, he was also able to tap into his creative side during his life, like we mentioned earlier, with being a part of the Hollywood's golden age and making the most expensive movie. So did you actually watch his film in your research process? And if so, do you recommend that film or any other films that he's made? I did watch the film um, several times actually. So <laughs> for people watching it, so it's, it's, a, it's a great story. And I, I love golden age Hollywood and all the glamor that comes with that. And you, know, you can see in the trailer, he was friends with Gene Harlow and all these big stars of the day. Um, so the big film they made, it was called Eskimo. Um, and it was made in 1933 by MGM. And at the time, it was the biggest film ever made. The person who directed it, W.S. Van Dyke, he was kind of the James Cameron of his day. He had done the Tarzan movie. He later did the Thin Man movies with William Powell and Myrna Loy. It's a pretty big deal. Um, what makes the movie really interesting is that it was based on a novel that Freakin wrote. Um, same title in, in English. It was the same title as the movie. And he wanted to portray Inuit peoples. You know, he had lived among them. They had helped kind of forge him and help him become who he was. He was part of that culture. They had adopted him into it. He wanted to depict them in a more human way than they had typically been depicted in popular media. You know, there are a lot of ugly cliches and stereotypes around Inuit peoples. Um, and so he wanted to show them, show the humanness of them. Uh, the, the movie doesn't always hit all the marks it was trying to achieve. And if you watch it today, you know, it, it's an older movie. The pacing can be a little bit slow, but it's interesting because Freakin's in it. He plays the villainous sea captain. And it's mm. funny, you know, he, was, he was very into theater. He liked performing his second wife. She was a margarine heiress, but she was also a, an actress. Um, you know, he was critical of colonialism in the movie, but then he plays the villainous sea captain who is, you know, represents that. And for such a big swashbuckling sort of guy, it's funny to hear him in the movie. He always had a very small voice. It was a, almost kind of a sweet voice. It doesn't really match the body. So here he is playing this villain and he's this big hulking figure, but his voice was very nice. It was, it was it, so it's kind of a, it's a little jarring to hear that. Um, another interesting thing about the movie is during my research, I you know talked to a number of people in the Inuit community and I was talking to a young woman who told me that she and a culture study group that she has, you know, people just researching their own heritage, discussing it, practicing the language, they spoke a uh, would occasionally watch Eskimo probably once every year or two. Uh, she said there are a lot of details in it, such as the costumes and the language. They film a big portion of the movie in Inupiat and they just use intertitles um, as a way to kind of see into the past. She said they actually got a lot of details details right. And they would read Freakin to learn a little bit more about their older culture. And she pointed out that it matched up with a lot of things she had heard from older people, grandparents, great grandparents in the community. So it's interesting to watch, I think, too, for that aspect. 
That's awesome. And um, so Reed, we have a lot of people watching us live right now. Um, and so I'm gonna turn to our live feed and read a couple um, comments and questions. Um, so we have a lot of people um, in the chat congratulation, congratulating you on the release of Wanderlust. Um, we have Deborah, she's looking forward to reading this. And um, Robert says, this sounds like my kind of book. And Julie had a question. She's asking, what's your favorite book? Always love to hear what authors read. Cannot pick just one favorite, <laughs> but there are. <laughs> I figured this is You got 573. Go. You got 573 favorites right behind you right now. <laughs> <laughs> Wanderlust is my favorite book. It's my all time. Yes. There are so many, so many great authors. I love narrative nonfiction. I have a soft spot in my heart for narrative nonfiction. People who take real stories that really happen and then they can make it feel, you know, kind of like a novel. So, you know, Susan Orlean, Candace Millard, uh, Rich Cohen, David Halberstam, Nathaniel Philbrick, Alfred Lansing, Walter Lord. Uh, these are all you know, Stacy Schiff. These are all authors that I, I greatly enjoy reading. Some are on the on the bookshelf, back there. Um, I read a mix of fiction and and nonfiction. You know, for my own writing, I think you can learn a lot about style and just storytelling from fiction. And, you know, there's other you just learn real true stories from nonfiction. So that's what my own reading mix tends to be like. Um, so I know I didn't answer it with just one specific title. Uh, I, I read pretty broadly. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, and for me, so I've been kind of following uh, all the, the photos and stuff we got of Froykin, and it seemed like he would have like a killer IG right now if he was if he was <laughs> during this modern modern time frame. And so my thing is like, what type of camera? Because I'm like, you know, we got camera phones and all this, and even when I was growing up, it was disposables or or some Nikon old uh, Polaroid type situation. I'm like, what? who has a camera in the Arctic and what type of setup is this? Because I'm thinking about like the cartoons I watched as a kid and they would have this tripod and you had to put this veil over the top of you and hit a button to take a picture of, of anything. And so it it always kind of, always kind of scratch my head and wonder, especially in those type of extreme environments, like who's who's taking the photos? And I, I, I know I didn't want that job. Whatever, whoever, whoever that was doing that, that's the job I did not want uh, with him specifically. But so that's a great question. So Franken was really kind of snap happy when it came to taking pictures. He always had he had a lot of cameras. He took a ton of pictures, and so because explorers, that old explorer class, they also were very performative. Like they had to, they would go around. They do a lot of lectures. They would you know, just to raise money for their next expedition. And they're you know, publishing books. They really had to promote themselves. So taking pictures was kind of part of it. It's like you were saying, it's an early kind of, you know, IG social media kind of thinking mindset because they were promoting themselves. It's funny because on a lot of his expeditions, they took photos because part of the, their mission was anthropological. They were wanted to record these older ways of life, you know, with Inuit. So they had film cameras with them so they could record this. So a lot of the expeditions are very well documented. It's during the first Thule expedition, there's a scene in the book where he's rappelling down off of the ice cap, off this ice cliff, and he cuts his leg with a harpoon. There's actually pictures of that glacier from when it happened. I didn't include it in the book just because if you don't have that context, the picture itself, it's just of this kind of ice wall. So it wasn't really a, a very exciting picture, but it's interesting to see history that way. Also, the film was hard to develop on a lot of their photos. It was so cold. Um, but these photos, it actually make good album covers in a way, because they're so spooky and there's a lot of oh, yeah. weird shadow. And the <laughs> film didn't come out that often up there, but they were always taking pictures and because they needed to, to help promote themselves to raise money for the next expedition. No, that's super neat. So, Reed, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you today. As we wrap the discussion, where can viewers go to keep up with you? I have a, a website that's just my name, my full name. Um, I am on Twitter. I don't, I don't use it very much. Just updates for uh, you know book stuff and appearances and things like that, which is also on the website. I am also on 
Instagram. Um, I have almost no followers. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was something. For we'll change actually. that. We'll be your next three followers. Oh, we'll follow yes. you right after this. Everyone yeah. at home, it's follow cool. Reed Mueller. We got you. Isn't we'll take it, care of this. It's, it's an interesting lesson. The time for it was so analog and our time is so digital and reading about him and how present he always was in the moment while he was traveling. I really took that to heart while working on this book, you know, being just present in the moment and being a little less involved in these digital worlds um, just helps ground people. I think that was a lesson I personally took while doing the research, just reading about him and the presence he had just in those communities that were immediately in front of him and the people immediately in front of him. Yeah, it's, it's a different world we live in, definitely, because uh, you'll see any big moment I eat. I'm a big NBA fan, so I watch LeBron break the record, and I watch the All Star game, and everybody's got their phones up. No, no, everybody's watching the moment through their phone, and and, and there's right. you know a very few people that are just literally just taking in the moment, and uh, yeah, it's just it's just a you know once it it looks normal when you're kind of in it, but when you look from the outside looking in, be like, man, this is this is a and I'm a little bit older, so yeah, it's like this is kind of weird. You're not old. <laughs> I, I, I I know I, I I keep it together. I got I got a sharpie in my uh, pocket where I fill in fill in the grays and all that good stuff. So it's you know you just shave it's a lot of maintenance. Just yeah. It, <laughs> <laughs> but just as a reminder for our chief chat viewers, Wonderlust is available at shopmyexchange.com and in, in select stores tax free. Today's episode will be available on YouTube and you can rewatch with your friends or catch up with past episodes. Join us again at 11 a.m. Central on Tuesday, February 28th, when we welcome Nile Rogers of Chic to the show. Also, mark your calendars for 11 a.m. Central on Thursday, March 16th, when we welcome actress and entrepreneur Tia Mowry to the show. So we, we got a lot of great guests coming up. And Re, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, First of all, thank you for your service. Uh, so for many that don't know, Reed was in the Air Force, a prior, uh, former airman. And so we always got that that airman connection going through Lackland, that whole that whole thing. And so um, just thank you for your service and thank you for what you do to kind of take your passion and uh, share it with the world. And, and you know, get highlighting those, these folks in history that have done some amazing, remarkable things and bringing it to our doorstep. And so we just appreciate you for that. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate you and I appreciate you having me on. I, re I really do. Thank you. Gotcha. And it, so Reed, if you don't mind hanging on with us uh, until we uh, till we get off the live and then have our formal goodbyes, but I just want to say thank you again for your time. Um, we, we definitely going to go support Wonderlust, and we're going to help build up your followership on IG. I know you, you you're not on Twitter as much, but we'll, we'll get a couple of freaking reels on your IG to get, get it rolling. And, and matter of fact, Emily's like the Sounds the social media guru for the exchange anyway. So uh, we, we can help you out in that regard. Yes, we got you, Reed. We got you. Got you, got you. But uh, thanks again, Reed, and uh, Chief Chat out, you guys.